<clears throat> thank you, thank you, and uh, it's good to see some friendly faces in the audience here, some former colleagues and folks I've seen from different parts of the country, different parts of the world, and I am going to be no competition for the cookies now, I think. Um, <laughs> I, I might as well just stop now at this point. Um, uh, <laughs> I, the, uh, your two favorite slides, where's Mike? Did he, where's Michael? Sorry, did he, did he just stepped out? For a second? He's breathing. Uh, his, uh, his two favorite slides about the airplane just reminded me of a joke about the, uh, the new Dreamliners that are being come out, uh, that, that, that Boeing is putting out there. They're actually in the cockpit now. They're uh, installing dogs, pit bulls, in the, in the cockpit now. And uh, the pit bull, uh, and they're redoing the jobs of the pilots. So the pilots only have one job now. Uh, their job is to feed the dog. Uh, and, <clears throat> and what's the dog's job, per se, is to make sure the pilot doesn't touch the controls. <laughs> and, and so we're getting to a point now where in, in other industries now, where we're, we're having, uh, you know, innovation has gone to a point now where the controls or the mechanisms there, but the intelligence is being built in there to account for all the variability, everything that's there. So we can look to other industries, I think, and there's some inspiration there for that. That's going to be part of my talk today. I, I do have to bring apologies from... Uh, my colleague Peter Bryant, who was originally scheduled, and probably the reason some of you folks were coming, and uh, I, I don't sound like a Kiwi, nor do I look like Peter Bryant. Uh, he had some uh, health issues over the weekend, and uh, the doctors grounded him for the week. So uh, I, I work with him closely on, on all of these things, and uh, so I'm, I'm stepping in for today. So apologies if, if I go off the slides for a little bit. But one of our, our main uh, thesis I'll put forth in front of you folks today is that uh, there is a whole bunch of innovation happening already in, in the industry. Of course there is. The industry has been innovating for a generation, for, since the beginning. Uh, mining has built uh, civilization, built society. But the problems that mining is facing today are so complex, so challenging, so overwhelming, changing so quickly that incremental innovation isn't going to get us there. And we can kind of tinker around at the edges, but unless we face some, so we seriously look at some disruptive innovation, uh, the industry is going to be uh, disrupted from the outside. And I'll begin with a quote from someone we actually were quite... Uh, is it going to go the right way? Uh, I just moved to a Mac, so I'm, I'm still learning here. Um, from uh, from our, uh, Mark Kutafani, who many of you guys know personally here, he, he said this many times. He said, you know, the rate of innovation in our industry is such that if we don't get our act together around innovation, 20 years from now, the biggest mining companies in the world aren't going to be mining companies. They're going to be somebody else. They could be the GEs of the world. They could be the IBMs, the Schlumberger's. Other people in other places are going to look at mining and say, we could do this better than they're doing it right now because they're not changing. And the sad thing is, if you, all, everything you read about disruptive innovation is that most of the time the incumbents fail to innovate, and it's usually new players that come in and, and, and change the industry. So that's kind of the, where, the state of where we're at. And uh, we've held this view for a while, and we actually, I'll talk a little bit about some of the work we've been doing at Mark at an industry level, something around the, um, the intersection of technology and sustainability to drive innovation, and we're, something we're calling the, the uh, through the Kellogg Innovation Network around a development partner framework, uh, then I'll talk about it in a second. But I want to quickly go through some trends. Uh, part of this comes from a presentation we actually gave to a major oil and gas services provider who was looking very interestingly at the mining space. It's saying they're looking at mining and say, for all the challenges that are in mining, there's a whole bunch of stuff we have on the shelf that we could probably bring in. And uh, so actually SLAR was a part of this, uh, uh, this little project that we did. So I'm going to bring in uh, some of the trends, and you guys have seen them before, but I want to help build the story of where we are as an industry. So the first trend is, oh, uh, there. First trend is, you know, we're in a sawtooth cycle. So right now we're at the bottom of a tooth. You know, the market seems to be for free for all. All of our investors are short term and they think, you know, the sky's falling, everything, shut everything down. But the reality is, is the world needs mining. Uh, modern civilization is going to require mining. And sure, the froth is maybe off in China, but the rate of urbanization is continuous. The relentless pursuit of people from villages to cities is going to proceed. And they're going to live in big cities and they're going to need all the people that big cities need. You know, Canada is one of the biggest urbanized, economy, uh, urbanized countries in the world and everyone is inching towards that. That's going to happen. And if you look around us, you've got to look at Union Station uh, in the West. Uh, all of our public infrastructure, infrastructure is going to have to turn over in the next 20, 30 years. Otherwise, it's, it's, it's falling apart. You look at the rate of bridges, and you go to Montreal, you talk about the bridges. All, all of our infrastructure needs to have. So two big drivers, they may not be the 10, 20% growth we've seen, but mining and the needs for the products of mining are going to be, uh, are going to continue uh, to drive the world economy. But the environmental concerns are mounting up, right? At the end of the day, we're getting to the point now where traditional mining is being increasingly unacceptable 
to the world. We're having uh, NGOs, local communities, governments. This is one of the reasons why everything's taking longer to do is that we're getting to a point now, and this is the kind of uncomfortable truth, is that people look at mining and say, we don't want mining to happen in that way. We understand that mining has to happen. The products of mining are important for our society, but the way that mining is happening right now is not tenable to us, so it needs to change. The energy requirements, we just talked a lot about the energy. It's unsustainable. You know, in South Africa, you know, 40% of, uh, of the electricity used in South Africa is for mining. And where there are brownouts, well, are you gonna, are you gonna give uh, electricity to the local villages or you're gonna give it to the mines? And, and so energy costs are gonna continue to increase unless there's, pr and there's pressure on public infrastructure in all places. And at the end of the day, artisanal mining is the thing we don't all like talking about. But it was there before we got there. It continues, and it's a, it's a it's a complete smite on the industry, and it's something you know we're, we're dabbling around. But uh, this is what's killing the reputation of the industry right now. When people think of mining, you ask any of our kids or grandkids or nephews and nephews, they think of the dirty old coal miners because that's what they you know the pick and the shovel, or they they have pictures of uh, blood diamonds, blood gold. This is the perception of mining in the world, and we have not because we're not addressing this effectively. This is coloring the entire industry. And this is what's leading to the geopolitical pressures we're seeing everywhere. Everyone here in this room knows what, it's, uh, what, what the regulatory process is. You, know, you guys are all smarter and you're all up to your eyeballs in this stuff. Getting new mines online, never mind if you can figure out the economics and the operations, trying to convince people that the mine is actually a good thing. We're losing that battle. Uh, states are competing against us. You know, all of us, have done, you know, uh, we had our foray when we were barrack. We were in, uh, uh, we were in Russia and we were learned anybody who's done work in the stands and all the places in the world where we all have to go, uh, nationalization is a huge issue. Or if it's not nationalization, it's increased concessions. Um, or flat out just appropriation of assets. These are real world problems that we're all dealing with. And at the end of the day, we've done a lot as an industry to improve on social license, no doubt about it. In terms of community relations, and in terms of long-term investment in the communities, local procurement, local jobs training, we're doing all that. But the pace of expectation is increasing faster than our pace of change. So our social license to operate gap is actually increasing in many places because we're doing everything we can, but it's actually just not good enough for most economy, most communities. When we actually look at how we're building, you know, finding, building, operating mines, it's getting harder. Everyone knows, you know, there's no secret here about the rate of, you know, our exploration sophistication is unmatched compared to what it was in history. And our budgets, although they're, they're down now, traditionally look at the last five years, never poured as much money as we have into exploration. And we have never found as little as we are finding right now. And so exploration is, is getting harder and harder. So finding new mines is harder to do. Building them is even harder. And everyone in this room knows the cost of balloon. You know, we're getting at the point now, what was the, the quote from uh, the CEO of BHP around the Olympic Dam? The Olympic Dam is never going to get built with traditional mining methods. It's unfeasible, given the overburden, the size of trucks. Everything is needed. Faster, bigger trucks are, is not the answer there. Something else has to change for those kind of, those kind of properties and increasing number of our assets to become feasible in the long term. And our capital, our capital friends in the room here are getting increasingly impatient about the risk profiles we have and miners have taken on a huge debt. So their ability to innovate is actually suffering as well. And then running the mines, everyone in this room knows this one. You know, we're, grades are going down. We're deeper than we've ever been. Uh, the OPEX, you know, uh, it's just amazing. I, I, and I'm very new to mining. I've only been in mining about 15 years, right? So I'm, I'm learning. <laughs> I'm new to mining. Uh, you know, I remember when gold was, you know, $300 and we were dreaming of the day it got to five, $600, right? That would be the glory days. And then it got to $1,800 and now it's $1,200, which is where we were before. And now we're all crying at $1,200. Look at what's ha what other industry has gone through that in the world where, you know, our commodities, our commodity prices are maybe double, triple where they were 10, 15 years ago, but our costs are so out of the roof that that actually is, makes us still unprofitable as an industry in many ways is right now. Uh, so the productivity, we talk a lot about productivity declines and, and this is the grades are a big part of it, but also the skill shortage that Michael talked about, this is hurting us. And at the end of the day, despite all our gains in safety, people are still dying at our operations, right? We're one of the few industries in the world that still, you know, doesn't matter all the change, all the improvement we've had in the world, people are st we're still killing our employees and the war for talent only intensifies. And when we're closing mines, actually, anyone ever been to the Eden Project? It's one of the jewels. If you ever get to go to, uh, in, uh, it's a side trip from London. It's in Cornwall. Eden Project is an old tin mine that is 
absolutely rejuvenated the entire area around uh, in, in Cornwall. It's past Plymouth, it's out that way. It's an old tin mine that they've turned into this, they call it the Eden Project. It's these biodomes. It's, it's so hard to describe, you just gotta go and see it. It's, it's these bio reserves, it's one of the biggest seed uh, resource centers in the world. They have, it's an art center, a cultural center. People from London go on you know, day trips, weekend trips out there, and it's just this amazing thing. And it's literally what do you do with a hole in the ground, and these guys imagine what could be there. And, but it's an amazing idea, but there's thousands of old mines in the world. What are we gonna do about them? And many of them are gonna require monitoring and, and, and oversight for perpetuity. All this stuff is, is piling up. So despite all those issues, Despite all those challenges, what have we done around R&D and innovation spent? Uh, we did a study a couple years ago, and we're refreshing it right now, and the average mining company is spending about, I'm trying to remember, 0.25 to 0.4% of revenue on R&D, innovation. And part of that, we had to, it was hard to get that number because a lot of companies, exploration, R&D, all that spend is kind of thrown together. 0.25, 0.4%. The oil and gas industry is at around 4%. And then you go to aerospace, or if you go to you know, Google and Facebook, you know, they're off the charts, they're 20, 25, 30%, right? Because they don't care about profits. Um, but, but oil and gas and mining, and you think of oil and gas is at least 10 times bigger than mining. So already that, so it's, you know, they spend 10 times more every company. They're 10 times bigger as an industry. Then look at their supply base. They have all the oil and gas service companies that are out there spending just as much. So there's, what is it, $400 billion or something. There's a, I, I, that number's misquote. There's, Order of, or, orders of magnitude more spend going into oil and gas than there is into, into, into mining. And we're probably at the lowest, lowest level of innovation spent in, in almost any sector. So despite all these problems, we should be innovating, or we're, we should be trying to do everything we can to innovate around it, but the money's not going in. And suppliers know this. Our supply base, we've starved our supply base so much that incremental innovation is the name of the game in every industry. Let, we, let's talk to us about how we're gonna make that truck a little bit bigger, a little bit faster. And, and there are lots of startups out there but scale is a huge issue in the industry. You know, I, I, remember, I remember a direct quote from a mining executive that basically said to me, if it doesn't directly help us get the gold out of the ground, it's peripheral to our business, and it's always going to be secondary spend for us. So directly getting the gold out of the ground, not the investments we need to make to get the next mine built or anything like that, gold today. So that's attitude that has changed in the industry, but it's still very prevalent, and that's been one of the resistances around the IT innovation that has changed everything. Uh, our supply base, we have the big players, but then we just have, you know, add up the entire mining IT uh, sector. And I bet you there's a, there's a kid in California that, you know, is probably pers personally worth more than the entire mi mining IT sector. You know, we, we, it's still in its infancy. We haven't made the investment, and a lot of mining suppliers, one's been twice shy. We make deals, we, we, you know, we call them our best friends when they're at the top of the market because we need them to expand. We need every truck, tire, everything we can get. And when, the, and when times get tough, we rip off every contract and we try to screw them over as much as possible because we're trying to survive and they're trying to survive. So we're like the GM type of, we have GM type of relationships with our suppliers where other industries have moved to the Toyota relationship with their suppliers. That we're in this through thick and thin in the long term. So we're really, you know, shooting ourselves in the foot on many fronts here. So when we look at innovation, this is, you know, people will debate, has there been, you know, people, we always get pushed back. Of course there's been innovation in mining. Absolutely. And you kind of look at through history, these are just some examples here of how we've been able to drive the cost down over time, and you know, this, is, this died out a couple years ago, and it's picking up. Of course, it's been huge, huge innovation, but I, I would uh, say that going forward, the same level of innovation that's got us where we are now. You know, what's the saying? What got you to where you are isn't gonna get you to where you need to be. The same level of thinking that we have of how do we make the trucks, the shovels, the mill processing better, that's not gonna get us where we are. I think we're asking the wrong questions. Questions are right. Why the heck are we moving 300, Three, why are we putting 300 tons of dirt into a truck to get this much gold out of it? On what planet does that make sense? That's a question we should be asking, right? As opposed to how can we get 400 tons into that truck or get that tr truck to move a little bit faster? So, because if we look at, this is a fun, this is my fun slide. Um, if you look at every other industry in the world and we look at where they've come, you know, look at uh, planes, phones, manufacturing, a shovel and a truck in a pit, a shovel and a truck in a pit. <laughs> that, that was probably steam, <laughs> it was electric, and I'm sure somebody's looking at, can we just get steam back? Um, when, when, the, when, the, when, the, when the diesel price went up. Right, we're, we're, we're at a point now where, you know, if it isn't, if, you know, what's the answer here now, right? We're, we're, we're running towards a cliff and we're just getting faster and faster at it. Something's gotta give here. 
and it doesn't matter, I was, we were with uh, some mining folks this week and they did, they're internally in their company, they did scenario planning. The strategy guys took them through scenario planning of uh, commodity goes up, what happens, commodity goes down, what happens, tech, uh, uh, costs go up, costs go down, what happens? And they just built a, uh, a scenario and all four of those uh, buckets, the answer was technology. Doesn't matter what the world is gonna look like, investments and innovation have to happen whatever is happening in the world. Because innovation and becoming a low-cost provider, and those two things are linked. Low-cost provider, you're gonna survive the downtimes and you're gonna make more money than anybody else on the upside. And technology, because it doesn't matter what the futures are gonna look like, you need to be in the picture. And the reality is, is that for us to adopt a new cost structure, to get away from you know, the, the cost per tons that we have now, is gonna require a game changer. It's not gonna be just incremental changes. They're not gonna bring, they'll bring our maybe cost per ounce down another 100 bucks, 50 bucks. If we're ever going to thinking of having our cost per ton, cost per ounce, it's gonna take a totally different game changer. So my thought, so we're, we're, uh, compared to the last presentation, we're floating at a, at a different level. We're thinking about this differently. He's doing great work on the ground now, what we can do. We're trying to get the industry thinking at the other end, starting to think about this a little bit differently. So where can innovation happen? Where are we gonna innovate? Uh, there's been a, starting to get more and more investment on the technology side of things. Uh, and we're saying that's, that's great, but we're also thinking innovation can happen in the business model and how mining companies are actually structured, how they organize themselves, the players they let in the, in the room, the, the people on the team. So there's different opportunities for, for, for innovation in mining. And these are just some high level ones and, and I don't think there's any surprises with these ones. You know, but interesting, focus on key value chain components. What is the role of a mining company? Is, is everything a mining company does right now, is that what you should be doing? I'm on the board of a hospital foundation, on, the, on a hospital up in, up in Brampton, and long ago they got rid of the, they got out of the laundry business, they got out of the porter business, they got out of the catering business, because their job is to fix people. And they said if, if it doesn't, it isn't directly related to fixing the people, we don't want to be doing it, because that's a distraction to us. Other industries are having these conversations over and over again in every space. Every industry is trying to outsource things. This is why India is where it is. Uh, we need to be thinking about what is the role of a miner? What is the true role of a mining company? And why are we doing everything else in the world? Um, on a personal level, if you ever read a book, it's a, um, you probably read this, right? Four Hour Work Week, Tim Ferriss, he's a, he's a great, and one of his things is that in life, the only things you should be doing are the things that are so important, you can't have anybody else do, or things that are so interesting, you don't want anybody else to do. All the crap in the middle, get rid of it. Get somebody else to do it. Find somebody else for whom that is really important and get them into the mix. And you know, when you look at our friends in the oil and gas business, this is why the oil and gas service companies are as big, or if not bigger than some of the oil companies. Because the Halliburton's, the Schlumberger's of the world, the Baker Hughes of the world, they're there. They catch everything the oil and gas companies don't want to do, they pass over to there and they find a way of making it happen because they find the scale on their end of things. So I think there's something to be said around conversations we can have as mining companies and as different types of money flows into it. And, you know, our friends in private equity look at all sorts of businesses they're probably gonna ask questions that we've never asked before ourselves. Like, what is our core business? Why do we exist? You know, data analytics integration, I think there's, you know, we're still crying for uh, the major systems integrator in our, in our industry. We all have silos and we're connecting different parts of it, different nodes of the network, but who's bringing all of this together? Uh, I think there are different companies attempting at it, but there's huge value for someone who actually cracks that nut on, call it big data. I won't go too much into it, that's a whole presentation, but big data in our industry. Next generation mining methods, we'll talk about it in a second, but you know, we got to figure out how, trucks. You know, how, do, how do we get rid of the trucks? I, I, you know, in what world does it make sense to be sending human beings down three kilometers into the planet, other than in science fiction? There has to be something, something else around there, right? You know, the, you want to improve safety at an underground mine, stop putting people underground. Uh, that'll improve your safety rates pretty quick. So I'm being provocative on purpose here because I think these are the questions. We're so, we're, we're as an industry, we're, we're fixated on, because of the markets, because of the leadership models we have, because of our annual plans, we're fixated on the next quarter and the next year, maybe a couple of years out. And it's funny, it's the irony of an industry where our mine lives are 30, 40, 50 years. So we're making investment decisions out 40 years, but we're making management decisions out a year, six months, maybe a couple of years at most. So we're in a way, and this, I'm part of the industry, so I'm, I'm being self-critical here. We're an industry that is very over-managed and under-led right now. We have lots of management systems coming in, but where's our leadership systems coming in thinking about the next generation of mining? Um, cost reduction to value creation. Slashing budgets should never be confused with cost reductions. 
And we, we assume those two things are the same thing. Slash the budgets 20% across the board. That's how we're going to reduce our costs. That, there's, there's very little correlation between those two things. Uh, there is a mining, one of the major mining uh, groups, and we, we learned earlier this year, they fired basically their entire innovation team. I'm sure they reduced a bunch of costs because those are all probably a whole bunch of really, really smart guys. And they probably, you know, took a, took a few million, million bucks off their budget. I would say that's probably one of the most short-minded things you could be doing. And then the last thing is this development partner framework I'm going to talk about in a second. The entire premise of why a mining company exists just to create shareholder value is something that needs to be challenged. What is our contribution to society? What is our contribution to communities? What are we doing for nation building? What is our global responsibility? We as need leaders to step up. So I'm going to take a, how much, are we doing okay for time? A few minutes? Um, I'd just minutes? like to say, um, you know, it's just past one now. I yep. don't know if people have other things on the schedule, but uh, for those who have time to stay, I'll be about another 10 minutes, if that's okay. 10 minutes is, is fine. Is that fine? I haven't seen anybody fall asleep yet, so as soon as I, first person falls asleep, I'll, I'll stop at that point. Um, so one of the studies that, that you know, uh, Slar was helping us out with uh, is when we were looking at uh, an exploration, uh, that's a loaded word here, in uh, an analysis of oil and gas. And we said, what, what are some things in oil and gas? And these are very high level musings that we came up with, but what can we learn from oil and gas? And what we found is that there's kind of three or four things that we can be thinking about. There's things right, out, right off the gate from oil and gas we can start bringing in. There's some big breakthroughs we can be looking at. And then there's some game changers in oil and gas that require at least 0.001% of that 0.25% within an industry saying, geez, this might just change how we mine in, in general. And oil and gas, it's funny, oil and gas looks at us and they think we're very sophisticated in some areas and we kind of look at them. It's kind of the grass is greener on the other side. But when we did the analysis, this is some of the areas we came up with. So the first one is around Drilling and coring systems. You know, directional drilling in, in, in oil and gas is just, it's just how everything is done. And their ability to drill, the, the, uh, the, uh, the size of the holes now is getting bigger and bigger. The amount of technology that you can put down the hole is increasing. And something around directional horizontal drilling, there has to be implications for us when we look at every aspect of drilling at, at, a, at a mine site. You know, I, we were at, when we were chatting with the oil and gas guys, they said, so how, how deep are you guys going uh, with your drills? And I said, you know, you know, I'm not a mining guy. He said, you know, the deepest mine in the world is 3,000 meters, 3,500 meters. So we're not going further than that. And we started laughing in a way. They chuckled because they're like, you know, our engines don't even get warmed up at 3,500 meters. Because these guys are going down to 10,000 meters. They're going in, you know, they're going to the bottom of the ocean here and, and you know, hitting things with a, you know, within a couple of feet. And so th they got drilling figured out at a whole different level than, than I think. E There's a lot there we can learn. Submersible pumps, this was just an odd one. We found that in the, in, uh, the reliability and the, um, the level of uh, ingenuity and innovation that's gone into some of the submersibles, we just found fascinating in terms of the life, the breakdown rates, the reliability, the number of hours they need. Um, they're more expensive, but we found that was interesting. But those are things off the shelf. Remote monitoring, uh, remote operation centers, you know, Real Tinto has them now. BHP's just opened them. I don't know a lot of companies looking at it. Um, Oil and gas companies have got to the point where they've consolidated functions not just internally, they've consolidated them and outsourced them. That's what Schlumberger's have. You know, these guys have huge remote operation centers where they manage operations, they manage rigs for a whole variety of, of, of uh, operations and different operators. And in some cases, they're the operators, sometimes they're monitoring them. They're, they're at least a half a generation ahead of us on that. You know, geosteering, this is the directional drilling I was talking about. Resource characterization, I, 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 the amount of analytics they do downhole uh, was was wireline and, and all all the stuff there. There was, I, we just we were just looking at. It, and I'm not a geo guy. I'm not a med guy, so I'm, I'm not going to even claim. But there was a whole bunch of things there. When we shared it with some of our mining guys, they said, "Well, we do some of that, but we do all of it on the surface, where these guys are doing it real time, and uh, making real time decisions based on it." So there's something there for us. And then when we look at f unconventional oil and gas uh, fracking, you know, fracking has something has huge you know, hydraulic fracturing has huge potential for us, I th and we'll talk about it in a second, but where, where's the exploration of that in mining? There's something there of whatever we can do to reduce 50% of our cost for comminution, anything we can do to make that easier underground uh, and reduce our costs on surface, that, that's something worth evaluating. So quickly, you know, this is a traditional mine today, and we came up with some sketches of what, what could be. So one of the thought is, you know, what if you know, the ore body is very contained, very distinct, and we just created these micro factories where you have directional drilling, you have real-time uh, analytics on the ground, and literally you just went down and drilled down, drilled down, drilled down, drilled down, and make your way through. And if it's a small ore body, 
And these things could be four or five feet across with some of the, things, some of the, some of the uh, technologies that they have. Now, they haven't been focused on making as wide boreholes as possible, but if they put their minds to it, that could be something. But they have the ability to do this. And what if you went down there and uh, your cuttings are actually the things you're processing? So all of a sudden, the stuff coming to the surface is already ready to go to processing. You don't have to you worry about comminution on the surface. Something to ponder. Not obviously every situation in the world scale, but what, you know, the cost of implementing this is not even tens of millions. What if you have 50 of these on a site, rather than having to go through you know, three kilometers of overburn or, other, or putting, you know, putting people down? So just it's something to muse about. And then the other thought we thought about is now in-situ leaching. This is the other one. We know we do this in, uh, with uh, some copper and some uranium, right? I think that's where we were doing in situ. So what if we actually could fix the lixiviance? That was my word of the day I learned a few months ago. Lix you know, around actually getting some of this stuff underground. And what if you said hydro you know, directional drilling plus hydraulic fracturing plus in situ leaching? Could be a game changer. Don't know where it would work. Don't know how it would work. All those technologies are proven, but putting them together now costing a lens at mining, what could be the potential there? So. I'll leave it at that because beyond that, my, uh, my, uh, my level of expertise would diminish. But for us, I wanted to plant the seed today. I'm starting to think about the next generation of mining. This could be, it could be something like this. So uh, last couple of things is uh, we had this great opportunity and, uh, uh, um, to engage with Mark Kutafani and some of the other mining leaders. Actually, Mike was on that trip in uh, Brazil through the Kellogg Innovation Network. Uh, went on a trip to Bra uh, Brazil and uh, Kellogg Innovation Network is something we're part of where the, the tagline is uh, global prosperity through innovation. And they convene every year, so it's part of the Kellogg Business School, and they think about how can innovation help kind of tackle the world's problems. And they invite everybody from NATO generals to mayors of cities to governors to CIOs of, of different organizations. And, and Kudafani was looking at mining and he said, I want to do something around mining. And we had the session, and after the end of the session, we got back and we had Mark Kudafani and then Ray Offenheiser, the head of Oxfam. Uh, America in a room and both of them sat down and one of them said the world needs mining the world cannot exist without the building blocks of mining uh, it has to happen and it's a it's a leverage point for for uh, global economic prosperity but we got to get it right and it's broken we have to fix it the other CEO got up and said mining is fundamentally broken mining has not lived up to its expectations to society to economies to investors to employees to communities it is broken and it needs to be fixed. And we were shocked by who said what. Oxfam guy stood up and said the world needs mining. And the mining got up and guy and said mining is broken. And that's when we knew we had something. So from that point, we've been working to create what we're calling the integrated development partner framework. And it's trying to reset the conversation in mining. That mining needs to move from isolated, extractive focused players to being focused on being a part of global prosperity, trying to be a part of regional development. Um, we, have, we can talk about this later. We have a public launch that we're doing next week at the Ford Foundation uh, around the framework and a paper we've written on it. And the real focus is on getting to shared purpose. Because at the end of the day, uh, if the guys at the mine, uh, next to the mine, are fighting with you and trying to shut you down, they're fundamentally disaligned with you. Um, shared purpose is something we need to get. We need to get the environmental part right. That's going to be a... And the reason I bring this up in a sustainability context, these are all drivers of innovation. Flourishing ecosystems is going to be a driver of innovation. And at the end of the day, having competitive communities, countries, and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and companies is important. And this is as important now. You know, in the Globe, Globe had a great article of what's happening in, out in, uh, uh, in Western Labrador. You know, all these investments that were happening at Wabash, through the, all these dreams, housing prices through the roofs, and all their life and mind planning is what happens when all that iron ore is gone, what are we going to do at the end? Well, I haven't even got to that. You know, mining is you know, literally done for many people right now. Where in their life of mine plan? Where in their sustainability plans? Where in their CSR plans, government relation plans? Was there a 50% reduction in your commodity price and the implications that's going to have on your local community? Well, you better be thinking of that up front. So this is an interesting concept where we're using this as a, as a driver of innovation. I'll finish with uh, one quick video that one of our guys did, and it's really talking about how incremental innovation is really important because it's setting up the building blocks for disruptive innovation. I'm Professor Rob Walcott of the Kellogg School of Management at Northwestern University, and I look at how larger organizations, established companies in particular, try and figure out how to innovate on an ongoing basis. So 
like to think about metaphorically the fortress and the ship. The fortress is your ongoing business, competitive, successful. The ship, these are the people out surfing the high seas looking for gold, but they didn't know exactly where they were going to find it. Companies need to have both. They need to have people in the fortress, the core businesses, to focus on being exceptional at what they do right now, but they also need to have people who are out seeking the future. One is not better than the other. The fact that it's easier and often cheaper to start brand new businesses today than it's ever been before is both a threat and an opportunity for established companies like Amway. For an aspiring entrepreneur, there are a lot more options today. Whether it's crowdfunding, Indiegogo, Kickstarter, whether it's digital businesses where I can get online and get moving faster and cheaper than ever before. The paradox is that becoming the best at what you do, which is great, that's our job, sets us up for failure in the long run. Most people are aware of Kodak. Here was an icon of global commerce. It dominated the market. Years ago, they had the world's best digital imaging technology, R&D. Somebody said in the company, you know what, wait a minute, that's gonna destroy our core business, which is analog film, where we're making an extraordinary amount of money. We would be idiots to do that, so let's just bury this technology in the lab. Well, sort of makes sense in the near term, but if you think about it, there are gonna be, I don't know, other people in the world thinking about digital imaging, and eventually, it's gonna get better and better and cheaper and cheaper, and that's exactly what happened. Fuji saw it coming and Fuji acted. Fuji made investments in new directions, and today they're a thriving, profitable enterprise, much bigger than they were before. And Kodak is history. Innovation is really not just about coming up with new products or cute concepts. It's really about business design, thinking about all the aspects of the business. And changing some of those aspects might be very difficult for an established core business, but it's something that a separate group can experiment with and get it right before you start to transition it out into the real world. Innovation creates great companies, and a group like Business Innovations, they bring some of those tool sets to the table. Every company really needs to have people who are scanning the world so they can take threats and turn them into opportunities. So I guess the question is for us, you know, our, our fortresses are actually pretty clear, right? Our fortresses are our core operations. Uh, they're, they're the fundamental minds, and those need to fundamentally keep, we need to keep improving. That's where all the continuous improvement, operational excellence, all those efforts are going in. And, and, and great mining companies are doing a great job. Um, you know, I, our friends, uh, I was just visiting with a good friend at uh, Gold Corp. Q3, the they, uh, the CEO announced they had $187 million in operational excellence savings in just this year alone from a program that started at the beginning of the year. Uh, that's incremental improvements that have happened at the, at the fort right now. And we all know those are there. We have an industry where prices, have, you know, our, our, our costs have been going up for 10 to 15, 20% a year for a decade. There's something there we can, we can improve, absolutely. But that's just the fortress. What's gonna be the next promise line? Where are those ships? Where as an organization, I'll kind of leave you this, is that as an organization, what are the, the ships you're setting sail? Where's that next round of innovation gonna come from? And because if you tell this guy, well, by the way, your job is to guard this, and, and every once in a while, jump in the boat and go see what's around the corner, that, that can't happen. Those are two fundamentally different roles in an organization. And these guys have a very different set of rules around selection, investment, ROI, than these guys do. These guys, you know you're gonna set a thousand ships adrift. 20% of, of them are gonna crash, they're never gonna go to the harbor. 30, 40 of them are kind of going to get there, and then 20 of them are going to be rock stars. But how are you going to know? And you have to be able to accept that the 20 are going to crash if you want the 20% that are going to be rock stars. Can't have that here. You can't have the guy in the, in the, in the, in the, uh, in the truck being the innovator. His job is to do his job. Uh, 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 but here, this is where the role for innovation is. So the last slide I have is just our approach for, for innovation is that we, we call it foresight, insight, and action. And really for us, is foresight is understanding what's going on in the world around you. I think as miners, and most industries do this, but I think mining is particularly insular when it comes to the, the magazines we read, the websites we visit, the people we hang out with, the people we talk to, the shows we watch. I think we're a very, we talk to ourselves a lot. And I think uh, for us, foresight is about getting ahead of the game, seeing what's coming around the corner, meeting people in very unexpected places, uh, going to, you know, being part of challenges, extreme challenges, going out there and, and seeing the world because those are the insights. Those are going to be the data points. Those are ships. Individually, we all have, we're all a fortress and a ship as well. So what are the individual ships we're sailing? Out of that comes some of the insights where we're saying, if this is what's going on in the world. These are the major trends forces influencing the world. What does it mean for us? And then coming up with a portfolio of options. 
uh, that are internal, external, some things that your guys are doing, some things you're investing in, you're part of things at an industry level. I see our friends from CIMIC are here. You know, there's things we need to do at a national level, at an international industry level, but then we're funding things across sectors. So there's really about creating a portfolio of opportunities across the organization. So this is for us our definition of innovation. So there's incremental innovation that we're all doing, but if we want to get ahead and get actually into disruptive innovation, we need to start thinking about some of these things. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.